pray and we can begin. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the Shabbat. Thank you for the time together. Thank you for your word. We pray that uh, this teaching today would bless us and speak to us that we may be fruitful for you. In Yahushua's name, Amen. Amen. So we're going to continue our discussion from last time at the end of uh, Genesis 9. And I've been kind of just wrestling with this like I didn't really want to talk about it, honestly, but some uncomfortable topics in here. But um, this morning, I just saw some really cool stuff. I saw some cool stuff earlier, and I didn't really explore it much, but I added some into the study. So it's pretty fascinating. I'm not making any definitive statements on any of it. It's just um, I think you'll find that some there's some pretty interesting connections that can be made throughout Scripture just based off this little blurb at the end of Genesis 9. So we're going to continue that discussion where Noah becomes drunk and uncovered in his tent, but uh, we're going to reread it to refresh our memories. And then I'm going to go into chapter 10 and read the first part of chapter 10 because it goes into Tom's descendants and we're going to be referencing them a little bit in this study as well. So I want, to, I want us to get an idea of who they are. So picking up in verse 18 and then going into um, chapter 10, verse one, verses 1 through 20. And the son of Noah, sons of Noah went out from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and the whole earth was overspread from them. And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunk, and he was uncovered inside his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders, and they went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and came to know what his younger son had done to him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, he shall be a servant of servants to his brothers, and he said, Blessed be Yahovah, the God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be their servant. And Noah lived 350 years after the flood, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Now, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We're just going to read Ham's today. And sons were born to them after the flood. Um, skipping, these are the sons of Japheth. We're going to verse 6. And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mitzrayim, and Put, and Canaan. Um, Cush are Ethi where it says Ethiopians. That's the descendants of Cush. Mitzrayim are associated with Egypt. And I'm not sure about Put. Um, let me look at that real quick. Uh, Persian, Persian tribes, it says. And we have Canaan, we have Canaanites come from Canaan. And this, the sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, and Rama, and Septeca, and the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. And Cush fathered Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before Yahovah. There it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before Yahovah. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. So Babylon is coming also from these descendants of, of Tom. And Erech and Ahad and Kalna and the land of Shinar. Out of that land he went forth to Asher and he built Nineveh. So then we have Nineveh also being related. And the city Rehoboth and Kalah and Rezin between Nineveh and Kalah, which is a great city, and Mitzrayim, that is Egypt, fathered Ludim and Anamim and Lehabim and Naphtuhim and Pathrizim and Kalulim, from whom came the Philistines. So there's another 
set of folks that come from the descendants of Ham, the Philistines, and Kaphtarim. And Canaan fathered Sidon, his first, firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Girgashite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arvidite, and the Semarite, and the Hamathite. And afterward, the families of Canaanites were spread abroad. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as you come to Gerar, to Gaza, as you go in towards Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Zeboam, even to Lasha. These were the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues and their countries and in their nations. I'm not going to go into great detail about this, but I just want to pull out some of those well-known Gentile, what we call the Gentile nations, come from uh, Ham. When we read this account in Genesis 9, it's natural to want to dissect it and figure out exactly what took place because it's kind of vague. And there are various thoughts about Noah's nakedness as it relates to some laws that we'll read about in Leviticus chapters 18 and 20, which talk about uncovering the father's nakedness or the nakedness of the father. But I just want us to be mindful that while these connections may be relevant, and I think we're going to see some relevance, the Torah doesn't specifically give us all the details about what took place. So it's my suggestion that we use caution in filling in the gaps and calling them fact. I feel more comfortable saying this is a possibility and look at these connections rather than setting my seal upon it as this is fact, this is what took place. That's just my two cents. But this is another one of those instances that we each will have to decide for ourselves what, how we're going to read it. My plan is to focus on patterns and spiritual messages within this account as righteous instruction for us. Like, what is, how can I apply this to my life? How does this affect me? What can I glean from this as more of a holistic approach to the scriptures? So we're going to start, go, we're going to go ahead and start by looking at Leviticus 18 and 20, which talk about uncovering or seeing the nakedness of those who are related to you or who belong to another. So we're going to head on over to Leviticus 18. We're going to read verses 1 through 3 here, where it says, And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, I am Yahweh your God. You shall not do like the things of the land of Egypt. Remember, that's Mitzrayim, one of uh, Ham's sons. You shall not do like the doings of the lands of Egypt in which you lived. And you shall not do like the doings of the lands of Canaan. There is another one of his sons where I bring you. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances. So this is interesting. And we consider that Canaan was the son of Ham who was cursed. And Egypt, or Mitzrayim, was the son of Canaan. Um, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. They're both sons of Ham. God is literally saying, don't do the wicked things that Ham's descendants do. And then he goes on to talk about these sexual sins and uncovering nakedness. So that's an interesting connection. Now, Noah's nakedness can simply mean his own naked body. It's his nakedness. But the scriptures also describe a man's wife as also being his nakedness due to the fact that man and wife, when joined together, become one flesh. Thus, to have relations with a married woman is equated to uncovering his nakedness because she belongs to her husband. So this is what we're going to read as we continue on in Leviticus. We're going to read through verse 20. Yahovah says, you shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk in them. I am Yahovah your God, and you shall keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live in them. I am Yahovah. None of you shall approach to any who are near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am Yahovah. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. So it's also her nakedness, but it's also his nakedness. As we'll see here, verse 8. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is your father's nakedness. 
You shall not uncover the nakedness of your sister, the daughter of your father, or the daughter of your mother, born at home or born away. Their nakedness you shall not uncover. The nakedness of your son's daughter or of your daughter's daughter, you shall not uncover their nakedness, for theirs is your own nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of the daughter of your father's wife, begotten of your father, she is your sister. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's sister, she is your father's near kinswoman. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister, for she is your mother's near, mother's near kinswoman. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother. You shall not approach his wife. She is your aunt. And you shall not uncover the nakedness of your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife. She shall not, you shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter. Neither shall you undertake to un under uncover her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter. They are her near kinswoman. It is wickedness. And you shall not take a wife to her sister to vex her, to uncover her nakedness beside the other in her life. You shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness and the impurity of her uncleanness. And you shall not lie carnally with your neighbor's wife to defile yourself with her. Because of these verses, as you can see, some theorize that Tom didn't just look upon Noah's nakedness, but he did something much worse. Some surmise that Tom either sexually violated Noah himself while he was a drunk and passed out, or that he had sexual relations with Noah's wife, which would be his own mother. However, we are never told that Ham uncovered anyone's nakedness, just that Noah became uncovered and naked and that naked and that Ham saw it. So there is that distinction. However, Yahweh does go on to also speak against looking upon or seeing nakedness a couple of chapters later where there does seem to be a connection between seeing nakedness and uncovering it. So we're going to flip over to Leviticus 20, and I'm going to pick up in verse 9. We're just going to read verses 9 through 11, and then I'm going to skip down to verse 17. Verse 9 says, And any man who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be on him. And a man who commits adultery with a man's wife, who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And the man who lies with his father's wife has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood is on them. And then I'm going to skip down to verse 17, which says, And if a man shall take his sister his father's daughter or his mother's daughter and see her nakedness and she see his nakedness, it is a wicked thing and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness. He shall bear his iniquity. So there are a few interesting things that stood out to be of interest here. First, According to verse 17, we can see that there does appear to be a connection between looking upon nakedness and uncovering it, and ultimately it all points towards sexual sin of some sort. I will, however, throw in this caveat that there are many references to nakedness and uncovering nakedness in the scriptures that are not referring to sexual sin, but are referring to the shame of sin in general, and it can be used metaphorical in that way. As I read this again, another thing I found interesting to consider is that if indeed Noah had knowledge of Torah and Ham did have relations with his mother, then according to this law, both of them should have been put to death. Um, isn't that what we read right here in verse 13? No, where was it? Verse 11. A man who lies with his father's wife has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall be put to death. So that I thought was interesting. So if Noah did have knowledge of that, that did not take place. We know that nobody was put to death because Ham went on to father many children. Um, but what I want to go into now is the lesson of the importance of honoring father and mother that is concealed in here. Because I think this is one of the most important lessons that we need to focus on within this account. And it's going to 
really show the true weight of the command um, to honor father and mother. We talked a little bit about it last time. We have it related to promise of long life in the land and how we saw Ham's descendants were literally cut off from the land when Yahweh displaced them. Um, but I'm going to go back and look at verse 9 because I started with that verse for a very specific reason. Where it says, if any man who curses father and mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or mother, his blood shall be on him. And that was the same thing that was said about uncovering the nakedness. They'd be put to death, their blood shall be on them. So there is a, there is a connection there. But what's interesting here is that the Hebrew word for curse is not the typical word translated as curse. It's not the same word Yahweh used when he cursed the serpent in Genesis 3. He cursed on your belly, you shall go. Um, that's the Hebrew word arar. This is the Hebrew word kalal. And we can see some of the definitions to be slight, to be swift, trifling, of little account, be light. This is the main idea behind the word, um, to make some light of something. Here we see to be lightly esteemed, to lighten. Okay, so that's what I want us to focus on with this word, to make light of. So no matter what we believe about what took place between Ham and Noah, one thing we can say for certain is that Ham did not honor his father in this situation. He most certainly did kalal, lightly esteem his father in this situation. And to lightly esteem your father is in fact the opposite of what it means to honor your father according to the Hebrew language, which is why it's so important that we dig deeper into the language below because we can see fascinating connections and, and deeper understanding of situations like this. So let's look at that word honor in relation to or opposition to this word kalal, lightly esteem. So we all know this command, Exodus 12, 2012, honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord God is giving you. And this word honor, oops, I guess I didn't click it. Honor is kabed, and it's the opposite, to be heavy, to be weighty. That's what honor means, to make, it's not like a, um, you know, this is really a burden, but it's to give more weight to, like when Messiah talks about the weightier commands of the law. Make it honorable, make it heavy, make it mean something. Do not lightly esteem. So we have two words that stand in opposition to one another in relation to how we can regard our father and mother. And the scriptures seem very clear that Yahweh is very serious about honoring both our earthly and heavenly father and mother. So serious that it's a sin worthy of death. And this would be something that Yehoshua considers to be a weightier matter of the Torah, meaning it deserves more honor. In fact, he admonished some religious leaders for leaving off this weighty command of God to honor father and mother that they may keep their own worthless traditions, thus making light of this very weighty command. And we'll just read that to kind of refresh our memories. I'm sure you're familiar with this, Matthew 15, one through nine. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Yehoshua saying, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Or why do you make light of it, we could say? For God commanded, saying, honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of a father or mother, let him die by death. And this is ultimately what we just read. He who makes light of, lightly esteems father and mother, he is worthy of death. But you say... Whoever says to his father or mother, whatever you would gain from me, it is a gift to God. And in no way he honors his father or his mother. And you voided the commandment of God by your tradition. Guess what? They're actually making light of both heavenly and earthly father and mother. 
in doing this because it is God's word that commands it. He says, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you saying, this people draws near to me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, but in vain they worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Even from a plain, straightforward reading of Genesis 9, we can see this grievous sin of dishonoring the father. Tom purposely and knowingly went into his father's tent to see him in his shameful state, and then he chose to further dishonor him by broadcasting it to his brothers outside. Yehoshua also said that by our words we'll be justified and by our words we'll be condemned. The things that we say also hold much weight in God's eyes. We also talked a bit about this last time and how we must be careful to guard our tongues. The text is also deliberate to tell us that Ham was a father to a son named Canaan. Again, just from a plain reading, it could be that Noah cursed Ham's son as a consequence and a punishment to what Ham had done. And Noah did, in fact, curse Canaan. So we're going to flip back to that in verses 24 through 26 of Genesis 9. It says, and Noah awoke from his wine and came to know what his younger son had done to him. And he said, cursed be Canaan. He shall be a servant of servants to his brothers. And he said, blessed be Yahovah, the God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And this word curse is the same word, arar, that Yahovah used in the garden when he cursed the serpent. Just as Ham shamed Noah, so will Ham's son Canaan bring shame upon Ham. It's as if Noah were saying, in the same way that you dishonored me, so your son will dishonor you. Notice also that Noah did not bless Shem directly. He blessed Yahovah, the Elohim of Shem. Shem and Yahweh honored Noah by covering his shame. Shem's actions were righteous and glorified Yahovah honored the Father and our Heavenly Father. But Ham's actions were evil and brought dishonor, made light of, to not only Noah, but to Yahovah himself. Here we're also seeing both blessing and cursing. And isn't this the same thing we, we read about throughout the scriptures? Blessings and cursing. Blessings come if you obey the voice of Yahweh your Elohim and do his commands and his statutes and the things that he sees and calls right. But the curse comes upon those who do not. And one such of those curses, Deuteronomy 27, 16, is this. Cursed is he who thinks lightly of his father or his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Now we see both of these Hebrew words used in one place. Cursed, arar, is he who lightly esteems halal, or does not honor, his father and his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. I had mentioned the command, that the command to honor father and mother not only applies to our earthly father and mother, but to our heavenly father and mother. It's easy to see who our heavenly father is, but our earthly, I'm sorry, heavenly mother is a little more mysterious. Our heavenly father being God the father, but our heavenly mother, according to scripture, is the heavenly land of Jerusalem. However, there was a time when God was figuratively married to the earthly land of Jerusalem. And there are some fascinating parallels found in the scriptures as it relates to today's topic with Noah. Um, just, I'm not going to pull out all the scriptures that talk about the earthly mother, mother but um, the one that comes to mind is an um, allegory that Paul tells in Galatians about um, Sarah being a figurative representation of mother of us all, and she, she is likened to the heavenly Jerusalem. And then we know that there are some Proverbs that say, do not forsake the Torah of your mother, and the Torah is what's supposed to go forth out of Jerusalem. So there are some connections that can be made to this. And we're going to see um, some more right now. Um, okay, so where did I leave off here? Heavenly Father, blah, blah, blah. there was a time when God was figuratively married to the earthly land of Jerusalem. And we're going to look at some of those 
fascinating parallels in the scriptures. And I'm not saying it proves anything one way or another in regards to what might have taken place with Noah, but there are certainly some very uh, compelling connections, I think, that you will find. So we're going to begin by looking at Lamentations 1, verses 8 through 10. Where it says, Jerusalem has grievously sinned, therefore she has been removed. All knowing her despise her because they saw her nakedness. Yea, she sighs and turns backward. Her uncleanness is in her skirts. She did not remember her end and has gone down astoundingly. There is no comforter for her. O Yahweh, behold my affliction, for the enemy has magnified himself. The enemy has spread out his hand upon all her desirable things, for she has seen the nations enter her holy place. The nations entered her holy place, whom you commanded that they should not enter into your congregation. I'm going to look at something really quick. Congregation. Kahal congregation. I just want to see what word that was. So this is interesting here. God's people caused the land of Jerusalem to figuratively play the harlot by engaging in adultery or idolatry with the Gentile nations. Verse 8. Verse 8 said, all knowing her in reference to figurative sexual sin, despised her because they saw her nakedness. And verse 10 goes on to say how the nations went into her holy place. And this is, you know, kind of like a double meaning there. Um, they violated her. Uh, this is pretty remarkable, I think. God's people were lightly regarding their heavenly father and mother here. They dishonored Yahovah by allowing the nations and their wicked ways to penetrate the land of Jerusalem where they dwelt. Who's, and then we have to ask the question, whose nakedness was uncovered here? If we are going by the definition in Leviticus 18, yes, it was her own nakedness, but uncovering the nakedness of Jerusalem was to uncover the father's nakedness, was it not? And oh, what a grievous sin that would be. We're going to show some proof texts that Yahovah took the land of Jerusalem figuratively as a wife. Ezekiel 16, 1 through 8. Again, the word of Yahweh came to me saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. And say, so says the Lord Yahweh to Jerusalem. Your origin and your birth is in the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. And as for your birth, in the day you were born, your navel was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you. And you were not salted nor swaddled at all. No, I pitied you to do any of these things to you, to have compassion on you, but you were thrown out into the open field because your life was despised in the day that you were born. And when I passed by you and saw you squirming in your blood, I said to your blood, live. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. I have caused you to multiply like the bud of the field and you are grown and you are great. And you come in the finest ornaments. Your breasts are formed and hair is grown, yet you were naked and bare. And I passed by you and looked on you, and behold, your time was the time of love, and I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. So again, this is a righteous quality of Yahweh to cover nakedness. He did it in the garden for Adam and Eve. Shem and Japheth did it to Noah, and that was something that was an honorable thing to do after the character of Yahweh. And I swore to you and entered into a covenant with you, says the Lord Yahweh, and you became mine. And I washed you with water, I washed away your blood from you, and I anointed you with oil. I also clothed you with embroidered work, and I shod you with dugong sandals, and I wrapped you in fine linen, and I covered you with silk, and I adorned you with ornaments, and I put bracelets on your hands and a chain on your neck. And I put a ring on your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. And that's symbolic for when one would 
uh, take a wife. We saw that with um, Abraham's servant who came and found Rebecca at the well. When he came to find a wife for Isaac, he gave her jewelry and adorned her with those things to kind of claim her as wife for Isaac. Verse 13, and you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was of fine linen and silk and embroidered work. You ate fine flour and honey and oil, and you were exceedingly beautiful, and you advanced to regal estate. And your name went out among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect in my beauty, which I had put on you, says the Lord Yehovah. And then going down to uh, verse 35, it's a pretty long chapter. I just wanted to pull out some of this 35 through 39. The tables have now turned. She plays the harlot. Therefore, O harlot, hear the word of Yehovah. So says the Lord Yahweh, because your lewdness was poured out and your nakedness was bared in your fornication with your lovers and with all the idols of your abominations and by the blood of your sons whom you gave to them. Behold, therefore, I will gather all your lovers with whom you have been pleased, even all whom you loved, with all whom you have hated. I will even gather them against you from all around and I will uncover your nakedness. So now he's uncovering the nakedness to them and they will see your nakedness and I will judge you with judgments of adulteresses and with shedders of blood and I will give you blood and fury and jealousy and I will also give you into their hand and they will tear down your mound and will demolish your high places they shall also strip you of your clothes and shall take your beautiful things and leave you naked and bare I don't know if you're picking up on this at all. I'm not going to go into it, but this is very much related to Revelation um, with the harlot of Revelation. So once you understand this, it'll, it kind of makes that section make more sense too. So make note that both that Yahweh both saw the nakedness of Jerusalem and covered the nakedness, nakedness of Jerusalem and we can see how looking upon and uncovering nakedness can also be metaphor for spiritual adultery, which is idolatry. And I, the question that came to mind here initially was, did Yahovah sin when he both looked upon and uncovered the naked of, nakedness of Jerusalem? Because on the surface, we think, oh, that's a, that's a sin. Why did he do that? But it's not because he was husband to her. Jerusalem belonged to him. So he had authority to do that. And I think as Paul would say, against such things, there is no law. I thought that was just an interesting thing to ponder. But I want to look at a couple more passages that go on about this same idea. Going into uh, Ezekiel 22, verses 1 through 13, Now he's speaking to his people, Israel, who were in Jerusalem, the mother. And the word of Yahweh came to me saying, and you, son of man, will you judge? Will you judge the bloody city? So that's Jerusalem. And you shall make her know all her abominations. And you shall say, so says the Lord Yahweh, the city sheds blood in her midst that her time may come and makes idols against herself to defile herself. You are guilty in your blood that you have shed, and you have defiled yourself in your idols you have made, and your days are brought near and have come to your ears. Therefore, I have made you a reproach to the nations and a mocking to all lands. Those who are near and those far from you shall mock against you, O defiled of name, abounding in tumult. Behold, the rulers of Israel, each man by his might, have been in you in order to shed blood. In you, they have despised father and mother. I found that to be very interesting. In you, they have despised father and mother. In your midst, they have dealt with the stranger by oppression. In you, they oppressed the orphan and the widow. These are all weightier matters of the Torah. You have despised my holy things. You have profaned my Sabbaths. In you are men of slander to shed blood, and in you they eat on the mountains in your midst. They do unchaste acts. In you they have uncovered their father's nakedness. 
They knew they have humbled her, defiled by impurity. And a man has done abomination with his neighbor's wife, and a man has defiled his daughter-in-law in unchaste acts, and a man has humbled within you his sister, his father's daughter. In you they have taken bribes to shed blood, you have taken usury and increase, and you gained by extortion of your neighbors, and you have forgotten me, says the Lord Yahovah. And behold, I have struck my palm against your unjust gain which you have made, and at your blood which has been in your midst. Can your heart stand, or can your hands be strong in the day that I shall deal with you? I, Yahovah, have spoken, and I will act. In you, Jerusalem, the bloody city, God's people, the rulers of Israel, by their unrighteous judgment and abominable acts, have uncovered their father's nakedness. According to verse 10. In you, they have uncovered their father's nakedness. Now, I know you could read this literally and say, oh, they're, they're doing these things in the land. Could be, but from a spiritual perspective, I think this is very fascinating. Fascinating that what we're actually doing is dishonoring our Heavenly Father, which is has much more weight. Then if we turn to the very next chapter, we read a parable of two sisters who played the harlot against Yahweh with the nations. So as if this weren't interesting enough, when we go over to chapter 23, the very next chapter talks about these two sisters who fornicated in Egypt, which again, descended of Ham, and their names were Ohola, the oldest, and Oholiba, her sister, and they were mine. And they bore sons and daughters, and their names Samaria is Ahola, and Jerusalem is Aholiba. Remember last time how Keith brought up that notion that Noah became uncovered in his wife's tent based on the fact that the word tent was in its feminine form? Well, I think I may have found a connection of some sort to that. Because the Hebrew word for tent, as used in Genesis, Genesis 9, where Noah went, is the same word used here, ohola, which literally means her tent or tent in its feminine form. Oholeba means my tent is in her. I did not have enough time to fully explore this connection, but we are definitely seeing a message of idolatry against God being compared to spiritual adultery that took place within his own land, his own tent, complete with uncovering the Father's nakedness. As we continue, we see some of the lovers Jerusalem was defiled with were the descendants of Ham. If we go down to, we're going to start in verse 10 here, and we'll read through verse 39 about what happened here. It's all like the same thing kind of being spoken of in different ways. They uncovered her nakedness. They took her sons and her daughters and killed her with the sword, and she became notorious among women, and they executed judgment on her. And her sister Oholiba saw, so this is talking about Ohola, her sister Oholiba saw, she was more corrupt in her lustfulness than she, than she, and her fornications were greater than her sister's whoredoms. She lusted to the sons of Assyria, governors and rulers nearby, clothed most perfectly, horsemen riding horses, all of them desirable young men. And I saw that she was defiled. One way was to both of them. And she added to her fornications, and she saw a man carved on the wall, images of the Chaldeans, so this is Babylonian people, engraved with vermilion, girded with girdles on their loins, with flowing turbans on their heads, all of them looking like rulers, like the sons of Babylon and Chaldea, the land of their birth. And she lusted after them to the sight of her eyes and sent messengers to them into Chaldea. And the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love and they defiled her with fornications. And she was defiled with them and her midst was alienated from them. So she uncovered her fornication, then uncovered her nakedness. And my soul was alienated from her, just as my soul was alienated from her sister. So we see that connection again there. Yet she multiplied her fornications to recall the days of her youth in which she played the harlot in the land of Egypt. I hope you're picking up on all these lands that were descendants of Ham. 
and she lusted on her lovers whose flesh is like the flesh of asses and whose issue is like the issue of horses. So you longed for the wickedness of your youth when the Egyptians worked your nipples. I hate reading these things, by the way, but you know, you got to do what you got to do for the sake of the breasts of your, your youth. So Aholibah, the Lord of Yahweh, says this, Behold, I will raise up against you your lovers from whom your soul is alienated. I will bring them against you from all around. The Babylonians, all the Chaldeans, Pekod and Shoah and Koah and all the Assyrians with them, all of them desirable young men, governors and rulers, all of them third heads and called ones, all of them riding on horses. And they shall come against you with weapons, chariots, and wheels, and with an assembly of peoples, buckler and shield and helmet, shall set against you all around, and I will set judgments before them, and they shall judge you by their judgments. And I will set my jealousy against you, and they shall deal with you in fury. They shall take away your nose and your ears, and the rest of your you shall fall by the sword. And they shall take away your sons and daughters, and the rest of you shall be devoured by fire. They shall also strip you of your clothes and take away your beautiful jewels. So I'll make your wickedness to cease from before you and your fornication from the land of Egypt, and you shall not lift up your eyes to them, nor shall you remember Egypt any more. For so says the Lord Yahweh, behold, I will give you into the hand of those whom you hate, into the hand of, the, of whom your soul was alienated from them. And they shall deal with you in hatred and shall take away your labor and shall leave you naked and bare. And the nakedness of your fornication shall be uncovered, both your wickedness and your fornications. These things will be done to you because you have poured after the nations and because you are defiled with their idols. This is the bigger picture I want us to see. You have walked in the way of your sister, therefore I will give her cup into your hand. Now he's talking specifically to Jerusalem here. You've walked in the way of your sister. You went after, ultimately it was about when the tribes became split. Half of the, like the 10 tribes went out and played the harlot among the nations and Jerusalem stayed, but then they ended up doing the same thing. You've walked in the way of your sister and I will give her cup into your hand. So says the Lord Yahweh, you shall drink of your sister's cup deep and large and you shall be laughed to scorn and mocked for it holds much with drunkenness and sorrow. You are filled up the cup of horror and ruin the cup of your sister Samaria. So now we're seeing also not only nakedness and uncovering of nakedness, but also drunkenness. And you shall drink it and empty it, and you shall break its pieces and tear off your own breasts, for I have spoken, says the Lord Yahweh. So the Lord Yahweh says this, because you have forgotten me and cast me behind your back, therefore bear all your wickedness and your adulteries. And Yahweh said to me, son of man, will you judge Ahola and Aholibah and declare to them abomination, their abominations? that they have committed adultery and blood is on their hands and they have committed adultery with their idols and have also caused their sons whom they bore to me to pass through the fire to them to devour them and yet they have done this to me they have defiled my sanctuary in that day and have profaned my sabbath and when they had slain their sons to their idols then they came into my sanctuary or my tent perhaps in that day to profane it and lo this they have done in the midst of my house so as you can see these abominations were done in the midst of her in the midst of yahovah's tent in the midst of his house so perhaps the message concealed within this account in genesis 9 is much much bigger than it appears on the surface and i think there is much more to be uncovered no pun intended um, and I do, I'm going to kind of leave it there um, just to kind of ponder and meditate on a little bit, but clearly a, an interesting and deeper picture happening. I'm going to pause and let you guys comment, and then I'm going to go on and talk a, a little bit more specifically about Genesis 9 and the re repetitious patterns that are concealed in it. So does anybody have any comments or additional thoughts about any of that this is keith go ahead so you know you you did a good review bringing up you know even going through some of the scriptures that israel has had this problem uh and how yah sees 
some of this and even the spiritual thing about when whether it's your your direct assault on the Torah with these sexual sins or the metaphors of idol worship and you know those being sins of being a whore and all these other things that are well pointed out in scripture his metaphors for that I, I did come across and I don't know if you want to touch on this but there was a couple other you know things that happened like when Reuben he had sinned against his father uh, in Genesis 35 it was just after it's Genesis 35 22 just after they had uh, or I should say uh, Rachel had given birth to Benjamin and she died and then it goes into the scripture and talks about how Reuben went into Rachel's concubine uh, Bila and and that really you know upset his father so then later on when he goes to give the blessings uh, Reuben doesn't get a very good blessing at all he gets an insult and then well in second, also he gets his birthright taken away because he was the firstborn right oh yes yeah I, definitely that's why the first thing he says he just insults him and moves down the line to give the, the good blessings to uh, the other sons yes and then of course you know Judah gets gets the one of the best blessings mm -hmm. but but then in second Samuel we also have Absalom the son of David who was rebelling against his father and it's in uh, second Samuel 16 where verse 20 through 23 talks about how he took advice from one of David's past advisors who was had come up against David also and joined Absalom how Absalom should go ahead and on the top on the rooftop set up tents and go into his father's concubines as an act of defiance mm -hmm. and uh, for all of Israel to see that he was taking over and just things like that that have scarred Israel and this book is not afraid to expose these things because God knows of man's sinful nature and so this is not something that is I mean it's taboo to us but the whole thing is after these items that happened and then when it came time to define the covenant on Sinai you even pointed out there's this huge section talking about these uncovering the nakedness sins that God was very explicit to define to Moshe to say and if they do this just this is the punishment get rid of them I'm trying to get rid of this uh, craziness and this blatant sin and they should be punished by death so yeah and it's not until I think we really pull back like something I, I, I've been saying lately about how we approach the scriptures is that we we take a holistic approach to the scriptures I think when we we get in trouble when we dial into one thing and try to figure it out and and not hold it up against the whole of the scripture and that's what's difficult when someone wants to know like what it is you believe or why it is you do what you do and why so many of us struggled especially early on in our um when we came to Torah uh, struggled with trying to explain it to people is because it's not just one thing you can say to show this fullness of the word and I think that's probably the, the biblical word to use when I say holistic it's a fullness we're looking at this one verse that might be really difficult and we're going to say okay yeah, if I just look at this it doesn't really make sense it's difficult and it seems to be saying something that it just doesn't seem like it should be saying and then we take in all these other things from the scriptures and bring it up and then pull, hold that up to this difficult passage and then we can maybe make a little bit more understanding and see it a little bit more clearly by doing that and that's why it's difficult I think to just explain somebody to somebody what it is we're doing and I, and how that can relate to like the virgins with the oil as far as you know I've got enough oil for me but I can't give it to you because it's just it's enough for me and it's difficult to give that to somebody when it's something that they have to go out and gather 
and taken themselves. Well, I don't know why I got off on that tangent, but. <laughs> but not to, not to belittle the argument, because I'm not in no way being argumentative. We're just, we're just talking about that Israel and the people that came down from this uh, line, because everything's about genetics and God tracks who's who and looking at, you know, the seed. In that, in that scripture, when you get to Genesis 9:18, it's pretty interesting that here it's going along, and the sons of Noah were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And by the way, Ham was the father of Canaan. Whoa, what's that in there for? These these three were the sons of Noah. But why did they have to put that sentence in there? All of a sudden, Ham is the father of Canaan. Wait, we're just talking about the genealogy here. Of then it gets a little further. And then it talks a little more about this incident. And then from there, you know, we hear that, oh, there's this curse put on this Canaan. Who's he? And in Israelite thought, in Hebrew thought pattern, he must be the product of this, whatever happened, this sin here. Because that's just, you know, sort of the, the thought pattern. And this idea that Canaan became a little bit of a focus in this part of the scripture. So, yeah, then, that's a, another theory that's out there. I didn't really want to like, you know, get too deep on to that because again, I don't know that we can. Yeah, and uh, I'm just I'm it. just pointing out that without without without, you know, trying to say who's right wrong, what's the best way? I agree with your way as far as if we're looking at scripture, but when you when you look at it closer, you, there are questions that come up. Why did why did it point it pointed out in such a way and what happened? And there's a lot of different things that shouldn't surprise us because God is truth and he's not going to hide the sins of his people. If anything, he brings them out, he exposes them, and he's trying to show that don't do what your forefathers did. I want you to be pure and walk in my paths. So, I mean, it, to me, yes, it is a little shocking or whatever. We There's a lot of shocking stuff in the Bible. A lot of things yeah. that you, or, you know, you're like, whoa, did that happen? But at the same time. It's I not as bad when you have to, when you read it to yourself, though. When you have to read it out loud in front of people, it's a little. <laughs> right. Or if there's questions to explain it. But I guess the way we look at this is, yes, God does not hide the truth. And at the same time, there's lessons to be learned. And then when you come to Sinai and you see there's all of these commandments against such sexual sins and because humans are humans, you know, and you, if, if you see someone naked and you get all excited, we know what the next step is that's probably going to happen. So this idea of keeping people covered and keeping away from the nakedness keeps sort of sin at bay because you're not yeah. exposing their nakedness. So I'm, I'm just yeah, and it, and it applies in more than one way, which is you know, literally, and you know, as far as like just hearing about or knowing some secret sin or something that somebody might have done wrong, even if they repented of it, and you going out and uncovering it and telling everybody, you know, that's another way you can uncover someone's nakedness. You know, so there's different and, ways of, of yeah, doing that. Well, well, and the thing is, you know, like when uh, Absalom went up against David, he was blatant about going in defiance of his father. This was almost a Ham's act in defiance of his father. And, mm -hmm. you know, and by the way, boys, I I saw my father's nakedness or whatever. But the whole thing is, I'm not, I'm not shocked at the same time. I am, you know, I take it as a warning. I take it as, you know, this is something that the 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 line of uh, the prodigy that came through, we can see now that after Ham did that, it did not bode well for the people that were part of that seed down the line because they ended up getting cursed. Yeah. So. Yep. Um, Very so, sorry, I was going to say, I'm sorry to interrupt, but... Uh, I just, you know, no one's seeing the hands being raised. So um, I was just going to bring up that verse in chapter 9 where it's like 24, 25. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son did to him, he said, cursed be Caden. It doesn't say 
and cursed was Canaan because of this. It says, Noah said, cursed be Canaan. How could Noah know who Canaan is if that's what he said? It's not like announcing Canaan was cursed because of this. It was like Noah saying, cursed be Canaan. No, Canaan was a product of this sin that... Yeah, kind of a... and the, the theory behind that is that Moses was writing this, and he's looking back at it, and he knew the name and all that. And so, you know, that's he's the product of this unlawful union but i really exactly. don't want to get like, into that i know that um i know that keith probably would you know could explain that but i'd rather just move on and um yeah no um, i think moving it. on would be good i just wanted to say but that that's my point and like if someone was looking back on it in writing they would say like i feel like they would say and cursed was canaan and not noah yeah. said cursed was canaan because that feels like a false report yeah, I I agree. I I had the same thought. So it's that's why I was like, well, you know, let's not. I don't want to get into all that uh, stuff that could happen. I want to focus on the things that we can really glean from this. So that's where my where my direction was with that. Um, and I think Mike had a hand raised too. Yes, I've been patiently awaiting my turn. <laughs> No, I was just going to say, uh, I think you did a really good job at tying a few ideas together about the uncovering of the nakedness and the honoring of the uh, your father and mother, and, and both from like an individual level and national level, you know, whether it be, you know, the, the house of Israel, the people of uh, Jerusalem or, you know, an individual doing something. And I think that, you know, th this event in chapter nine um, has some individual consequences, but also as we get further down the road in Genesis, we'll see, um, as you pointed out, his who his descendants are, um, have some long-reaching um, consequences or connections to uh, not honoring the father and uncovering the, the their nakedness. You know, mm -hmm. we know Egypt's role. We know that, you know, eventually uh, they do move into the land of Canaan and, and these people are um, going to be servants to, uh, to the good line. So I, I think that um, you did a really good job at pulling all of those pieces together. Um, and then the, the one thing that you guys kind of briefly touched on was about um, Reuben and then Judah getting the blessing. And, you know, I think the other two sons in front were Simeon and Levi. So you got Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, three sons in front that missed the firstborn blessing. And ultimately, because they didn't honor the father, you know, it, it yeah. came down to them doing something that dishonored their father. So, yeah, and, I think that, that's kind of what I wanted to pull out is because honestly, I don't know that even I realized the gravity of that command and, and how widespread it is over the scriptures when you really dig in and look at what that means to esteem lightly or to honor your father and mother and, and just how big it is and how it relates to how we're ultimately regarding our heavenly father yeah and i think even at an individual level the gravity and responsibility it is as the bride not to allow someone to uncover our nakedness or um mm -hmm. or or for us to uh, uncover our own nakedness through sin, like what kind of right. dishonoring that does to the, to the husband, to the father. Yeah. And I, 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 there's so many like ways I could have gone with this and I was just spending so much time on it as far as, well, it's nakedness and what's covering and, oh, it's such a big thing that I just decided I need to streamline this and not get into, get too far off topic, but. I mean, you know, Messiah says to one of the churches, you don't know that you are poor and miserable and naked and um, you think that you're clothed, but you're not. 
kind of thing. And there's, you know, this idea that he covering is a covering of forgiveness, like a covering of sin. And we're, we'll touch on that a little bit here. Um, but yeah, this is a pretty widespread. I think there's some little nuggets in here that actually have a hold a lot of meaning in them. So thanks for being patient with me on this. And I know that we could probably talk about this for a while. Um, but now I'm going to take a different viewpoint, a little bit of a different viewpoint, and and look at repetitious patterns in here because I think there's also some really valuable um, insight to be gleaned in that respect. Um, because we know that God teaches us many lessons through repetition, and even just what we looked at was basically the same thing being said in different ways, repetitiously. Messiah told the same thing in parables in different ways. Um, and we've already seen some of the repetition of the days of creation within the Noah story as he got off the ark and it was like a sort of recreation happening after the flood. That was very similar to the creation account in the beginning. And if we look closely, we'll see even more of those repetitious patterns continuing within this short account as well. They're very subtle, but they're there. And I think we focus on these things. It will also point us toward these weightier matters of the Torah that are concealed within passages like this one. All right, so we're going to look at some of these patterns as they compare to what took place in the Garden of Eden. We know that Adam was placed in the garden and was given charge of it. And according to Genesis 2.5, God created Adam to till the ground, which the ground is the Hebrew word Adamah. In addition, Adam was formed from the dust of the ground, Adam all. And here we're told that Noah began to be a husbandman, husbandman, right here, and he planted a vineyard. And if we look at this sentence in Hebrew, it would read, and Noah began to be a man of the ground, which is the same word, Adam all. So that's what they're translating as husbandman, this man of the ground, and planted a vineyard. So like Adam, Noah is a man of the ground in a sense and working in a sort of garden as he planted and tended to this vineyard. And we also know that Yahweh compares his people to a vineyard. Uh, and I believe it's Isaiah 5. I could be wrong. but um, So there's, there's some kind of connection to the garden of God and the vineyard of God. And then Adam and Eve were told not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but we all know the story. They were deceived and partook of the forbidden tree, and all of a sudden they knew they were naked, and what did they do? They covered themselves in fig leaves and hid from God in order to hide the shame of their sin. In a similar fashion, Noah repeats this pattern by becoming drunk on the produce of the land, and we're told that he too became naked afterward. And as we've discussed, drunkenness and nakedness are both metaphors for sin. Then what did he do? He went inside his tent to cover himself, to cover the shame of his sin. So there's a similarity there. We also see righteous acts in both accounts. And God set this precedent himself when he covered Adam and Eve's nakedness in coats of skin which symbolizes how he covered the shame of their sin. Shem and Yafet did the same righteous act when they chose not to look upon their father's shame, but took a garment, walked backwards, and covered the nakedness and shame of their father. So they're covering the sin. But then I look, what role might Tom have played in this, and what pattern, if any, was he repeating? As I thought about this, well, I had a thought about this, that what do you suppose that old serpent, the devil, did in the garden after enticing Adam and Eve to sin against God? Do you think he said, oops, and, and just left, I'm getting out of here? No, he watched it all go down. And not only did he watch, but it's probably safe to assume that he took pleasure in what he saw, lifting himself up in his heart as he looked upon the sin. and his handiwork and the calamity of Adam and Eve and the shame of their nakedness. God does not take pleasure 
in these things or looking upon these things, and neither should those who serve him, as we see demonstrated with Shem and Yaphet. I'm just going to pull up a couple of scriptures here that um, relate to these things. Proverbs 6, 12 through 9 says, A worthless person, a wicked man, walks with a crooked mouth, winking with his eyes, speaking with his feet, teaching with his fingers. Perversity is in his heart. He is always planning mischief. He causes fighting. Therefore, his calamity shall come suddenly. He is quickly broken, and there is no healing. Six things Yahovah hates, yea, seven are hateful to his soul. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that plots wicked plans, feet hurrying to run to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and he who causes fighting among brothers. I was focusing here on this proud look or looking on with pride. And I think that we can say both Satan and Ham had a measure of this going on in these in these accounts. Ezekiel 18.32 says, Yahweh says, I have no delight in the death of him who dies, says the Lord Yahweh. Therefore, turn and live. And see, he told Adam and Eve, do not eat of that, that tree, because in the day you eat of it, you will die. He has no pleasure in that, but Satan deliberately did it. Therefore, he does has pleasure or delight in that and looking upon that. Han didn't just accidentally see his father's shame. If that were the case, there would be no fault. Not only was Ham very deliberate in what he did, he made sure to announce his father's shame to his brothers who were outside. This was not demonstrating the likeness or character of Elohim, but the likeness and character of the most cunning beast of the field, Hasatan. Proverbs 11.13 says, One going with slander is a revealer of secrets, but the faithful of spirit keeps the matter hidden. And this word um, hidden or covered is actually the same word um, for covered when they covered their father's nakedness in Genesis 9. It's like saying that they'll cover the matter. A slander is going to go out and spread it around town, but the faithful are going to cover the sin, hide it, and not spread it around town. Psalm, oh, I think I forgot to put this one in. I got one. Grab it here. Psalm 101, verse 5. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, I will cut him off. Him who has a high look and a proud heart, I will not allow. And again, I'm, that's what I'm, I have a feeling is taking place here um, with Ham. A proud look, a high look and a proud heart. Look, look at how far he's fallen. It's a Satan thing to, to say. The wicked look upon the nakedness of shame and their fall, and they take pleasure in it. Taking pleasure in the fall of others is not a characteristic, characteristic of our father. Again, it is of the wicked one. Um, Proverbs 17.5 says, Whoever scorns the poor reviles his maker. He who is glad at calamities shall not be unpunished. So we should not be glad at calamities or when our enemies fall. We're told not to take pleasure in those things because that's a characteristic of the enemy. Um, Proverbs 24, 15 through 18. Wicked one, do not lie in ambush at the dwelling of the righteous. Do not spoil his resting place. For a just one falls seven times and rises up again, but the wicked shall fall into evil. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. Lest Yahovah see, and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. So he doesn't like that. He, he's the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So we have to be careful how we regard others when it comes to 
they're falling or stumbling that we are not looking on with that kind of attitude or mentality. The scriptures speak of Esau's descendants who looked upon the day of his brother's calamity much in the same manner as Satan and Ham with pride and joy. And we'll see here, this is how Yahweh felt about it in Obadiah 1, 6 through 18. How Esau is searched out, his hidden things are sought out. All the men of your covenant have dismissed you to the border. The men who were at peace with you have deceived you and have overcome you. They are setting your bread as a snare under you. There is no understanding in them. Shall I not in that day even destroy the wise out of Edom and understanding out of the Mount of Esau, says Yahovah? And your mighty ones, O Teman, shall be afraid, so that each man from the Mount of Esau shall be cut off by slaughter. Shame shall cover you from the violence against your brother, and you shall be cut off forever. In the day of your standing on the side, on the day that strangers were capturing his force, and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, even you were like one of them. You should not have looked on the day of your brother, on the day of his alienation, nor should you have rejoiced over the sons of Judah in the day of their ruin, nor should you have enlarged your mouth in the day of distress. You should not have entered into my gate, into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Also, you should not have looked on his evil in the day of their calamity, nor should you have sent out against his force in the day of his calamity, nor should you have stood on the cross ways to cut off those of him who escaped, nor should you have shut up his survivor, survivors in the day of his distress. For the day of Yahweh is near on all nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reward shall return upon your own head. So these people who are looking on at the calamity of others, especially their brothers, with pride, that calamity is going to come back on their own head. For as you have drunk upon my own holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink forever. Yes, they shall drink, and they shall swallow, and they shall be as though they had not been. But upon Mount Zion shall be those who escaped, and it shall be holy, and the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of es Esau shall be for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and burn them up, and no survivor shall be to the house of Esau, for Yahweh has spoken it. Again, we see a judged as you have judged situation. And after Noah awoke from his drunken state, it says he knew what Tom had done to him, and he pronounced a curse and a blessing. Noah cursed Canaan, Ham's son, but blessed the God of Shem. And we talked about last time about how Tom's son Canaan and how his name means to be humbled or rather subdued. Ham's seed, Canaan, was cursed to be a servant of servants, if you'll recall. I'm going to pass back over here. And I'm making another connection to Genesis. Um, so this is what he said. Cursed be Canaan, and his name means to be subdued. Remember, under your enemy's feet type of thing. And it says, he shall be a servant of servants to his brothers. And uh, then he blessed the God of Shem. And um, do, 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 do. So Canaan was cursed to be a servant of servants to the righteous seed of Shem and his brethren. And a servant of servants implies what? The lowest of low. And this seems to again be reminiscent of what Yahovah proclaimed after Adam and Eve's fall as he cursed the serpent. I thought this was really interesting. Yahovah said to the woman, what have you done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And Yahovah said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every animal of the field. You shall go on your belly and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I shall put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Yahweh pronounced a curse upon the serpent. The serpent would go on all fours. He would go lower than low and lower than any beast of the field. I'm sorry, he would not go on all fours. He would go lower than low on his belly. He would have to go lower than low. And he and his seed would be subdued, like the name of Tom's son Canaan, under the heel of the righteous seed. 
Again, Noah did not bless Shem or Yepheth directly. He blessed Yahovah, the Elohim of Shem. And it is through the line of Shem that our Messiah would come, who would bruise the head of that old serpent, the devil. So I thought that was a really cool uh, pattern and connection with this story. So as God revealed this um, pattern to me, these patterns to me, I thought of the imagery of following the breadcrumbs, so to speak, of studying the scriptures from the beginning and finding Yehoshua through following the righteous seed and how the righteous servants of God conducted themselves as opposed to how the wicked seed conducts themselves. Because this is our life instruction. God's law, his Torah, is so much more than two tablets of stone delivered to Israel on Mount Sinai through Moses. It is so rich. It is righteous instruction for our lives that lead us and point us toward life with Yehoshua and his kingdom. So that's all I have. Um, anybody else want to comment or add anything else? Keith? Yeah, I was going to say the this uh, last review of these few scriptures talking about the idea that uh, we, I guess, to view the victory over our enemies and have it put in God's hands, that Yah is the one, is the victor, the judges, and that we should have compassion on our enemies. And, you know, many times, I guess, Israel was put in a place where their enemies came before them and the different kings had to figure out how they were going to handle it. Were they going to handle it spiritually or carnally? And a lot of them, they failed. They they actually sent messages to other kingdoms trying to get them to help defeat mm -hmm. this instead of going to the place of prayer, which was right inside their own city and praying to their God and having Yahovah give them the victory. So, mm -hmm. but yet what would happen is if you went to the, if you went to Cardinal man, man and went to through this idea of it was done on your own strength because you made alliances with other men, of course, then you were going to cheer on and have your, I guess, your haughtiness and your pride kick in, right? Mm -hmm. Where where if you prayed to Yah and you waited and it would be almost to the last minutes, you know, the, they're surrounding the city and they're starting to do this and attack and the next thing you know, the next morning, they're all laying dead outside the city because Yah sent one of his angels and killed 200,000 of them or whatever. And then you stand back in, in awe and say, oh, my gosh, you know, that's the power of Yah. And you don't rejoice. I guess you rejoice in his strength. But at the same time, right. you stand back and say, whoa, that's that's the power of God. And we need to be righteous and be on the right side of of judgment and so we're not going to be haughty and prideful we're going to now bow our heads down in the fear of the lord that mm -hmm. we ask for his rescue he will save us but because he destroyed those that were against us doesn't mean we should be haughty and say aha see our god wiped you all out no you should be saying the power of our god should be bringing other nations to come to Israel and say, what do we need to do to be on the side of your Elohim? And yeah, you should repent, be, repent, be, be for right. fear of the Lord. Right, exactly. <laughs> repent and fear of the Lord. And then that God had done that so many times. And there were nations that did want to learn more about Israel's God. I just don't know how they handle it or what they did to bring, you know, because there's many stories where that had happened and the kings went away saying, yes, Yahuwah is God, right? And, you know, our people mm -hmm. should should respect the God of Israel. And I think, you know, that yeah. always gave Israel an advantage against these other sovereigns in the land. But the fact that you pointed that out and the way the Bible is full of those incidents and now here we are petitioning God personally for help on our own problems and different things and praying for each other, but also praying for our enemies, praying for those in yeah. need that don't know, that may not know God, that may question your faith. We can only pray that he will touch them in a spiritual battle and bring them closer to him so 
they may be our brothers. Yep, no, that's a good point because, and that's something that we do need to consider in our own lives about people who are our perceived enemies, people who don't think the same way that we do and how we are um, regarding them. Um, we need to have that same mind. I was just reminded of um, Isaiah 31 when you're talking about going to God or men, and that's talking about how, you know, woe to those who go down to Egypt, which is symbolic for men, and rely on the flesh for help and don't call on or, or look to Yahovah, who is spirit for our help. When we do that, it says in verse three, both he who helps and he who is helped shall fall down together. That's the same thing that Messiah says about the blind leading the blind. They're both going to fall. So we need to make sure we're looking to God for our help. Uh, Ella, you have your hand up, honey. Uh, I was just going to say, Keith brought up a really good point, and that kind of reminded me of those verses talking about um, like the branches being grafted into, I, I guess, Israel, and how it's saying, do not boast that you have mm. been grafted in and that the ones that were originally there have been pruned, because how much easier would it be for the ones that were pruned to be grafted back into the original olive tree that it came from? Like That's a really good point, really good connection. And I'm yeah, going to pull that up here. Romans 11 is what she's talking about and yeah. uh, how, you know, Gentile, Gentiles are being grafted into this uh, natural tree, so Jew and Gentile coming together as one house. And if some of the branches are broken off, you being a wild olive tree are grafted in among them and become a sharer of the root and the fatness of the olive tree with them. Don't boast against the branches, but if you boast, it is not you that bears the root, but the root bears you. You will say then the branches are broken off so that I might be grafted in. Listen, that's dis this was that dispensationalism saying that all oh, the, the Jews have been displaced so that I can come in. Yeah, don't say that. If you say that the branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off and you stand by faith. Do not be high minded, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, fear lest he may also not spare you either. That's exactly what we're talking about. That's an excellent connection, Ella. Keith? So to bring this to current events, we know that Israel is in a battle with its neighbors. And we've seen all these crazy things transpire over the last year. And I'm, I know Israel didn't start this battle, and Israel is very, very strong with technology and using a lot of their own strength to be very aggressive and going against their enemies. And I know the United States and some other countries are joining in. She's looking to us for help. So when I pray, you know, I think, I, you know, I pray for the strength of Israel, but I pray that Yah would be involved in helping and somehow manifest instead of Israel in their own pride thinking that they're defeating all of you know all of this is happening with their own technology and their own strength and their own uh, slyness with their with their uh, intelligence how they're getting in and doing sneaky things and what, however you want to look at it I mean I want Israel to be victorious but I want her to be victorious for the right reasons and I don't want this to come back to haunt her because she's doing all this uh, without the strength of Yah, because you know Israel right now is mostly secular, you know, and I don't know mm -hmm. how many are, at, you know, we, pr we pray for Israel and we, we hope the best because it's a nation of people that, you know, our Messiah has blessed, but as far as the blessings that come from our prayers and what could happen, going forward, you know, this is troublesome to me because every time I see them do something new and bring the world against them because there's all this being built up in politics against them, and I don't know what it's going to lead to, but just keep that in mind too because I think they're, a, I don't know, fighting in their own strength, their technical strength and their military power, that they've gained in the mm -hmm. United States gives them a lot of weapons and help. 
and the world is, I don't know, seeing this and witnessing this. And I just don't want the world to turn on Israel. At the same time, you know, I know something supernatural will probably happen where God will step in. But I don't know. I don't know if anybody else had any thoughts on that because everybody should be aware or seeing that this is signs of the times and this can lead to who knows what as far as the revelation and different things that will start into the timing of uh, the end of days. So, Well, I mean, I can just see perhaps some connections in some of the stuff we read today as far as the nations coming against Israel, you know, and I think um, our Jerusalem specifically, but um, and then in Revelation it has the same language. So there, there could be some kind of, you know, physical thing happening that's related to that, but I, I don't know. I don't like speaking on things that I'm not certain oh, I, about. We're not trying to speak prophecy, but at the same time, we know that her enemies, a lot of the prophecies do talk about these names that are foreign to us, which are the older names for these Persian countries and Iraq and Iran, and they're all going to surround her and be her enemies of that of that other belief that this could lead to a greater war and you know who knows how how great that will affect the world and yeah you know, going forward there's a lot that we don't see but we have an understanding that it it could you know trigger to become something so much greater in that unstable environment over there so but yeah, I just want to know, you know, how many people do believe that are they doing it on their own strength or is Yah behind them? Because a lot of people think, oh, yeah, th this is all the will of God. But, you know, I don't know that. I don't know how Yah would really want them to handle their enemies and try to make peace and be peacemakers and try to. Because uh, right now, you know, everything's built off of get the hostages back and all this other stuff. It's a lot of politics and it's a lot yeah. about. You know, uh, the leader over there, he's struggling to keep his position. And there's just a lot going on. So I just was curious if anybody else had any other views. Well, it's something to keep on the radar and think about for sure. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for this study, for this conversation, for the thoughts that were invoked by your word for the guidance that you've given us to uncover things that uh, might have been disguised otherwise. So thank you for your spirit guiding us in all things. We pray that uh, you would watch over and protect this group and that you would keep us safe and uh, allow us to come back next time to discuss your word even more. In Yeshua's name, Amen. Amen. Amen.